So people all the time will say, yeah, I have a problem focusing and I have a problem paying attention. I procrastinate all the time, right? What they don't understand is that people who have ADHD experience this at a at a completely different level. And it is always like they are swimming against the tide. Today, we are in conversation with Sonal Singh, who is India's first ADHD coach, which means that she is trained to specifically work on attention, motivation, and focus challenges, along with organizational challenges or executive functional skills. She has an experience of 22 years. And uh, Sonal, I'm really excited to hear from you. To begin with, uh, what is ADHD? ADHD is a neurobiological condition. And according to many experts, it's uh, not only that you're wiring of the brain is different it is that um, you have a challenge maybe or a difference in the way that you regulate your attention in the way that you regulate your energy in the way that you regulate your emotions so all of those differences cause a um, a, a different again way of the way that you handle your uh, ability to focus your ability to pay attention your ability to manage distractions and manage your regular executive function skills which are basically how you get through life and what are the symptoms and how do uh, how does the diagnosis go so um, it works very differently for children and adults and what we find is that mostly ADHD symptoms show up across the board uh, with children under the age of 12. So usually that is the case. And uh, the way it shows up is many children will have a lot of struggles in paying attention In there'll be a lot of fidgeting. There might be a lot of movement. They might be distracted and getting lost. There might be a lot of impulsivity where they, you know, sort of interrupt uh, when somebody is speaking or can't wait their turn. It looks like they're always on the go, like constantly, you know, moving or jumping. And uh, then there are other kids that you'll be speaking to them and they're completely lost right because they're so distracted in their minds um, so that's the way ADHD really shows up and there are many more uh, symptoms as well aside from this is for a diagnosis you need to go meet a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist and get an assessment done with them. Now for adult ADHD, what happens is it gets a little bit more complex because with adults, um, there are other comorbidities or co-conditions that also occur. And many times uh, ADHD is misdiagnosed as anxiety or depression or bipolar disorder. So there are all these other challenges that occur and this happens across the world, not just in India. Uh, and since you said that you know a lot of children face this how common exactly is ADHD because people um, tend to treat it as something that okay now you're diagnosed so there's this one particular condition but is it common and is it something that uh, somebody can have from birth or can they develop it through their life so across the world it is research shows that typically around 10 to 12 percent of the population of children have adhd and that's a similar number that they've also um, sort of estimated in india so it is that number that is out there right now. Um, ADHD is also something that typically most uh, experts will not diagnose until the child is a little bit older. When I say older, around four to six years. Uh, four years is usually is, is not that usual. Um, I have found that when I have spoken to my clients, uh, when I have spoken to people around me in my coaching practice, in my network, normally kids get diagnosed a little bit later, around the age of six or above. The minute somebody says that, you know, they see a lot of hyperactivity, they'll be like, oh, this kid has ADHD. Or uh, sometimes we ourselves will say, I have ADHD, I can't pay any attention to anything, right? So there is a lot of generalization about this particular topic or this particular diagnosis. ADHD is diagnosed when the symptoms have been at a certain level for at least six months or more 
and um, you get that information not just from the parents not just from the individual themselves but also from the teachers and people around them to give feedback as to how that child is in their classroom environment in their personal or social environments as well as uh, there's a many times with many children there's also a self assessment that occurs and that's how you get information or diagnosis whether adhd is something that this is this particular child has or not is it different yeah. when girls get diagnosed with adhd or when boys get diagnosed with adhd and is there also like a age sort of difference that happens so how does this uh, you know uh, how is it for different genders uh, um so adhd is known as a you know difference that you mostly see with boys right it is that uh, sort of stereotype that we give but what really happens is that uh, and of course it's true that many boys do get diagnosed uh, with adhd versus girls but increasingly research says that girls are the ones who slip through the cracks and they have something called inattentive uh adhd so there is the uh, hyperactive adhd there's the inattentive adhd and then there's the combined adhd which is a combination of both hyperactivity as well as inattentiveness so many girls actually struggle with the inattentive kind where they are daydreaming where they are you know spending a lot of time doing the kind of things that uh, don't allow them to focus but um, it is many times diagnosed as anxiety it can be diagnosed again as depression so this is what girls and women actually experience and in your practice uh, what kind of stigma relating to adhd have you come across uh, what is really the general idea of adhd or even the clients themselves they might have a you know a way of thinking about it so how has it been in your experience many times adhd is not really recognized as valid right so people all the time will say yeah i have a problem focusing and i have a problem paying attention i procrastinate all the time right what they don't understand is that people who have adhd experience this at a at a completely different level at a very intense level and it is always like they are swimming against the tide right so what a neurotypical person supposedly like somebody who doesn't have this sort of a neurodiversity will take for granted like okay i don't really feel like doing my you know powerpoint presentation right now i'll do it later they will get to it at some point where they will be able to get it done and turn it in turn it in in the way that they want to but a person with adhd not only will procrastinate but they will procrastinate to the point that they will probably start working at it right before it's due and it can have very serious consequences there are many people with adhd who will get it done and and they thrive on it that they will get it done under pressure and you know turn it in and in fact because um, many many people are uh, with adhd are so bright they will actually do a fantastic job of it as well so you know the pinch is not felt as much but the journey to get it done is a very painful journey they carry a lot of guilt and shame along that process where they are not able to get started where it is a frustration as to why is this so hard for me and if only i had started when i needed to i would have probably gotten a much higher grade and what we don't realize is because of this intensity of the symptoms it has a very big impact on the careers that people with adhd have on the trajectory that their careers take both academic and professional careers that is it can have a impact on uh, an impact on their social life as well on their personal lives as well so there are very serious and real consequences to what adhd brings for people which somebody who's neurotypical doesn't experience for them the journey is of uh, everybody has in attention and you know difficulty focusing but they are very temporary phases in comparison going off on what you said about uh, there being serious consequences uh, 
when people you know in relationships and at in their careers so uh, when we come to the workplace like what is the kind of things that an adhd person could be facing in a non inclusive environment where they maybe are not diagnosed or if they are then there isn't that inclusivity so what kind of struggles could they be facing and how do you think we can sort of bridge this gap because uh, i i people don't really openly talk about it so these are people around us who are facing something and the people working at a regular pace and there are people who are struggling every day um, so i work with a lot of um, adults with adhd who are you know maybe young entrepreneurs or they are working in the corporate spaces they are lawyers and uh, the one big challenge that comes across the board is the fact that they really struggle with their executive function skills and what i mean by that is executive function skills are your ability to manage your emotions to regulate your emotions for example to regulate your um uh, energy it's the ability to actually make sure that your responses are appropriate as per what your you, you know what the situation demands of you you're able to estimate time so imagine if you have a project which is due and you are not able to estimate that okay the project is actually going to take me 4 hours to complete and you estimate that it's going to take you 1 hour right or it's going to take me 8 hours so what is the cost of that at that place right then the ability to also uh, not be able to pay attention to details that inability of you know sort of just wanting to get the work done so that you can submit it not necessarily be able to turn it like work in advance so you are able to review so many people with adhd find mundane and routine work very boring right and that's why many of these struggles occur and the executive function skills do not optimally work when a person is bored so for many people with adhd boredom is an is an actual emotion and it's an actual feeling where it's a painfully difficult experience they feel it in their body right and that's when function skills get impacted and that's when you, it shows up in your work what i find in my uh, experience works really well for many uh, adults or you know professionals who are uh, dealing with adhd is to make sure that they actually find a way to uh, make the process or their work uh, something that they are actually interested in that they get excited i i hate mm-hmm. to i hate to use the word passionate because passion is something that uh, you know comes and goes it changes over a period of time uh, so it's not that you're looking for passion necessarily uh, you're looking for something that excites you that energizes you and because you want to do things that excite you and energize you you're going to constantly find ways of making that environment support you and uh, what you do so a lot of people will try to find other colleagues that they can buddy up with and collaborate with to do projects right that is very helpful because um the adhd brain thrives on this back and forth on being challenged and stimulated right so you you will find that somebody who's collaborating or body doubling with someone else that means that they are actually budding up with someone else to do a project they're going to do a fantastic job because they are able to come up with the creativity they are able to come up with ideas and they have somebody to support them on the executive function skills to help them stay organized and on track to meet the project deadlines okay so that is one thing that you could do uh the other is that many people with uh, adhd again struggle a lot with just basic organization skills right and when i say basic organization skills it means just managing a schedule because it's so boring it is ultra boring to keep writing down in a diary what do i have to do tomorrow day after three days from now and you know keeping a track of meetings so if there are ways that you can automate these systems right and using technology to your advantage so if you have an apple phone or a android phone you know using the uh, like hey siri you know 
block this time for let's say x meeting or block this time for a workout and setting alarms so all of those little steps help in a big way and organizations and companies also can make sure that in their email softwares and in their uh, systems they incorporate these kinds of reminders right so this helps the person to make sure that they actually arrive to the meetings or arrive to their deadlines on time so for example if you see for kids um when they have their uh, google meets or microsoft teams right these days all the kids are online so they get reminders before a assignment is due the same thing can be also applied in the workspace and then um giving people with adhd and this is true for everybody because you know everybody sort of works differently at different times so making sure that you give a certain amount of flexibility for people to work and give projects based on deliverables versus just based on uh, like you have to make sure that you are at work from 9 to 5 right so what you are then doing is you are allowing them to structure their day in a way that they are able to use their strongest mental times to do their work especially the work that is hard in the best way possible to deliver it to the team or whoever they have to deliver it to versus let's say i am a person with adhd and i really struggle sleeping at night and you're telling me to be at work at 9 in the morning and at 9 in the morning i'm so tired i barely make it to work and then i'm exhausted the whole day and by the time you know my sort of uh, energy kicks in it's afternoon or late evening and then my deliverable is just not going to make it. right so making sure that the schedule is a little flexible to accommodate the way the individual thrives and works best and uh, yeah the last thing is making sure that you recognize somebody's effort and the and what they are good at so really operating from a strength based perspective uh, because again uh, people with adhd get a lot of negative feedback you don't make it on time you you know you're, you're so impulsive can you like not interrupt there's a lot of negative feedback that comes their way but very few times there is recognition of what they're doing well yeah you're so cool. when you talked about uh, you know ways for organizations to sort of set up reminders to sort of uh, have a more inclusive environment what really happens in the pandemic situation when people are working from home when children are attending online classes so is it that they have a more comfortable environment back home so that they can work at their pace or do you think um, it's the other way right so the pandemic has of course brought its own challenges initially everybody was excited that you know it gives me so much more flexibility the problem with any extreme situation is that we don't thrive right so we need to bring things back to moderation and uh, my biggest suggestion to every single person whether or not with adhd but especially if you have adhd or any sort of neurodiversity uh make sure you bring about a broad structure to your day and that it is aligned in a big way to what a normal day would feel like so what that really means is that we so imagine like you know when we were pre pandemic times we would go to work or we would go to school we would get ready in the morning and we would sit in the school bus or we would get into the car or into the metro whatever it is and we would get to work now that whole thing is a transition that we make from the home space into the work space or into the school space and then there is a structure to the day we are following our meetings there's a time that we schedule for lunch there's a time that we schedule for sort of self care breaks where we will go sit and have a cup of coffee with a friend or a colleague or just chat for 2 minutes here or there right and then again in the evening you would wrap up for the day and you would get into the car or into the metro or you know whatever cab and come home so you're transitioning back into the home space right and then you go to bed at a certain time because you know you got to wake up in the morning again what happens in the pandemic is that 
all these things are thrown out of the window because you pretty much wake up from bed sometimes you take a shower other times you're just in your pajamas and you move right from your bed to your desk if that or sometimes you just stay on your bed and you open your laptop or your computer right and that means your brain has not registered that it's time to work so really creating that transition ritual to move from you know one type of one aspect of your day to another aspect of your day and creating that broad structure that yes from here on now I'm at work and what this means is that I'm going to give let's say the next two hours or three hours steadily to my work commitments and as a person with ADHD I need to make sure that I build in certain short breaks to you know, sort of re rejuvenate or renew my brain, take a hydration break, take a little walk, because that helps my body settle down a lot better. And then take a lunch break, make sure that I'm adequately eat, like uh, hydrated and nutrition is at a good uh, place. And I continue that for the rest of the day. And then, you know, in the evening, I take out time for self-care. And what I mean by self-care is not, you know, just meditating or, you know, doing those sorts of things, but also talking to friends, socializing, reading a book, doing things that actually nurture you. If you decide to watch Netflix, that's also fine. As long as you do it without guilt, and, you know, you're not thinking, oh, I should be doing something else, but I can't, you know, I'm just watching Netflix and so do it with intention. So that's what self-care means. So having that broad structure in the day and letting organizations also understand it's very important to allow people to have the space to do it because um, many organizations are also in that state where they are thinking that their employees are available for them at all times since they are at home, right? So understanding that, yeah, that they are at home, but this also means that they're handling many other responsibilities and they need time to actually, uh, they need downtime to actually be able to perform a lot better, to actually be able to manage their executive function skills a lot better, to deliver what... So you talked about how uh, sort of employers can be, you know, bring in that support, but what about, you know, people uh, around an ADHD person, like friends and family, educators, how can they sort of create an environment that is more accepting um, of people with ADHD and and uh some place that they can actually thrive in without having to see these mundane obstacles uh that they do see every day many people with adhd both young people like children and tweens and teenagers that i work with um the adults that i work with uh find that the people around them really don't accept them for who they are right so they they will say yeah i know you have adhd but why can't you just get this done like you know you know that there is a schedule why can't you just follow the schedule we've made the schedule for you right now what people around you can do is really make it possible to build systems structures and very importantly acceptance around the fact that this particular individual is wired differently right so when i put forth what let's say as a parent or as an educator what i want this particular child to do i'm actually going to work with the child to make sure that they are involved in the process of planning that i make it fun and interesting for them so i gamify the process so if it's a schedule can i gamify the schedule can i make it an attractive visual schedule right can i help the child get some sort of reward every time they uh, accomplish something and reward is not in terms of buying something or anything like that the reward what could be as simple as that you know i'm scratching this thing off the list and i get some you know fun time with my parent or 
a good friend to play something which is very high energy or very fun, something that I really enjoy doing. That could be a reward, right? And uh, so that is one thing that I would strongly suggest that for educators as well as for parents to think about what the child needs, what are the lagging skills that they have and how to support them. So do they need, um, let's say they're sitting on the table uh, these days, you know, again in online school or even once they go back uh, to school and they need to move because it's hard to sit on the computer all the time so can you give them a gym ball can you give them more frequent movement breaks can you make sure that you give them high protein uh, snacks like you know all the nuts etc versus sugary snacks are they well hydrated have they slept well so can you make a good sleep routine for the kids that uh, that makes sure that they are getting adequate amount of sleep at night uh, without it being a burden um, so that is one thing that uh, you know, parents and educators can do. For the young adults and adults, I find they really struggle a lot with negative messaging as well, um, where the families don't understand that, okay, this person is, you know, genuinely really struggling, let's say in their career. Um, they go from one idea, like somebody started uh, doing engineering and from engineering, they have moved on to, uh, business from business they've moved into arts and then they are going back to engineering now the thing is you would think that this person is just not focused this person is completely confused the thing is that this person is looking for what they need that activates their brain and gives them that energy to thrive in it right and they are constantly looking for that place where they feel that, okay, this is a connect and their executive function skills can work optimally there. It's almost like it's a round peg that you're trying to fit into a square hole, right? So as a family member, as let's say an employer, what can you do to identify that person's strengths and really make sure that you support them in identifying the kind of environments and the kind of spaces that their strengths that they, their strengths really come out in and they thrive in it so it could be based on that versus let's say a field so you could go into the business field and you could be you know someone who's very creative so that does not mean that you go in and become, let's say, an accountant who's very busy with details, right? But you could still be in the business field and doing something in some other area of business. So making sure that we sort of, you know, assess our own expectations and align them to what is this individual's strength and where will they thrive versus what we want. That was a wonderful roundup of everything. Uh, so I think... I have sort of gone over all the questions that I had for you, Sonal. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Children with ADHD under the age of 12 receive some 20,000 negative messages, more negative messages as compared to a child who is neurotypical. So you can imagine what that does to a child with ADHD as they're growing up, it has a big impact on their self-esteem, on their confidence, on the ability to manage uh, rejection and criticism. So keeping this in mind, it's very important as parents and educators to think about how we are responding to our children. And that also means then in, you know, because children become adults, how we are responding to adults in things that they need support with, in things that they need help with. So asking a lot about what can you do to support them versus telling them all the time what to do, right? So really collaborating with them to find solutions and really collaborating with them to assess what is the kind of support they need? When can you come in with that support? What can they do to ask for help? And how it is completely okay to ask for help? 